It's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions. And this week, my first question comes from Vitamin W, who says, Hi, Steve. Nice explanation of cultural appropriation and the power dynamics that are involved with it. You said that's the definition used by people who worry about such things. Do you personally think it's bad, dangerous, harmful, problematic, etc.? How would we know where to draw the line? I love studying other languages. When I was young, I did other cultural traditions for my birthday, piñata. Obviously, none of these things are harmful, but they are certainly borrowing from a seemingly less privileged culture. Do you think cultural appropriation is trouble? If so, what harm does it cause, and to what extent should it be avoided? I think it does cause harm, and the reason why I think that it causes harm is that I hear lots of people of color and lots of people from other uh, marginalized groups uh, relative to this culture saying that it's a problem for them. So I take their word for it. I trust them to be able to figure out what is a problem for them, and I, I as a privileged person wanting to be a good ally to the underprivileged and to the marginalized, uh, I try to take my cue from them. Now, as to the problem you bring up of what, well, how do we know when the line has been crossed? How do we know what is sort of an acceptable uh, borrowing from another culture and what is cultural appropriation, which would be a more uh, exploitative taking from another culture? How, do we, how can we tell the difference? How do, where do we know when to draw the line? Well, that's the thing. You don't know. Uh, there isn't a line that everybody agrees, okay, this is the line, and over on this side, everything's cool, and over on this side, it's cultural appropriation, and you should avoid it. The way you figure out which is which, and the way you learn to tell what is acceptable and what isn't, as a person who isn't a member of the culture being appropriated, or as a person who uh, has never experienced cultural appropriation, or has never had any need in, in your personal life, to feel that it's problematic or to feel uh, harmed by it. So, in other words, someone like me. Uh, the best way that you can figure out how to make those judgments is to listen to people, and not just to one particular group, not just do a little bit of Googling and read one website or, or you know, join one Facebook group and read the discussion for a day or two and say, okay, I've got it. Really open yourself up and listen to what many different groups are saying, and then you'll have a body of knowledge that you can call upon when you're making judgments, like, is this cultural appropriation or isn't it? Jack Coyer, in your appearances on the excellent Late Seating podcast, you tend to have a rule that you only review films 10 years or older. With that in mind, due to the release of Batman v Superman, would you ever consider doing a double review of 2005's Batman Begins and 2006's Superman Returns, 10 in June, in the near future? That is, if you haven't already done so. Otherwise, could you give your brief thoughts on each film? I really like both, and I actually think Batman Begins is the best of the Nolan trilogy, and how you think a DC universe could have turned out if it had instead spawned from those two films. Well, thank you for mentioning Late Seating, and thank you for giving me an excuse to plug it twice in this video, because I'm still going to plug it at the end. Um, we have already done our Batman v Superman responses, our Batman v Superman crossovers, I guess. We reviewed the uh, first Christopher Reeve, Richard Donner Superman recently, and then we also did a special episode where we reviewed Batman v Superman, as you know, as, as you seem to be a listener. Uh, so that's all we're probably going to do as far as riding the coattails of Batman v Superman. Um, I imagine eventually we'll get around to both Batman Begins and Superman Returns. Uh, Superman Returns is probably a show we're going to do sooner or later because Jason and I have a differing opinion on it, and it'll be a fun show to do. Uh, but I don't know when. It probably won't be anytime real soon because we just did Superman and we just did Batman v Superman, so we don't want to have too many superhero movies, you know, piling up on each other. We want to have a more diverse roster of films that we're talking about. But I'm sure it'll happen eventually. I just don't know when. Um, I, I love Superman Returns. It is my favorite superhero film. I'm not nuts about Batman Begins. I, I don't think it's a bad movie. I just don't think it's that great of a movie. <laughs> there are certain problems I have with it. Uh, I think the, the supervillain plot in Batman Begins is really, really complicated and really sort of unwieldy. I don't like the treatment of 
Jim Gordon. I think he's basically just thrown in as a sidekick. They couldn't think of the David Goyer, who I think is an awful writer for the most part, uh, was writing a Batman movie, and he couldn't think of anything else for Jim Gordon to do in a Batman movie but drive the Batmobile. Like, that's his big reason for having Jim Gordon in the movie. So there's a lot about Batman Begins that I just don't like at all. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a terrible movie. It's just an underwhelming movie. But if we were to take the, the Nolan trilogy, which overall I have a very high opinion of, uh, and Superman Returns as the basis for a DC movie universe rather than Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. Um, yeah, I think that would have been vastly preferable to what we're getting. I think the Superman Returns version of Superman is much closer to a version of the character that I like, is a much more humane, much more heroic, much more sympathetic Superman. Uh, I think the Nolan Batman is uh, a much more acceptable version of Batman, is a version of Batman that uh, where it was established by the filmmakers, by Christopher Nolan in particular, that uh, it was interested in the moral complexity of Batman. It was interested in actually dealing with questions of what is a hero, does Batman do more harm than good, should Batman even be Batman? Uh, these are questions that uh, are sort of paid lip service very, very briefly, very fleetingly in Batman v Superman, but uh, in which the movie actually has no real interest at all. Whereas those sorts of questions formed the basis for the Nolan Batman films, especially The Dark Knight, uh, to a lesser extent the other two, but especially The Dark Knight. So I think it would have been a much, much more entertaining and a much more uh, creatively successful and artful, uh, artistically successful, I should probably phrase it, uh, version of the DC movie universe than what we're getting. Um, unfortunately, that's not what we're getting. Dragonface13. Hi, Steve. I'm a student of German and English literature and linguistics in Belgium, and even though I've been reading poetry as part of my literature classes for quite a while now, I didn't realize how beautiful some poems were until relatively recently. Since then, I've become much more interested in English poetry. I'm a big fan in particular of the English Romantics. Percy B. Shelley, John Keats, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, John Clare, etc. But my favorite poem would have to be The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. So my question to you, do you like poetry? You've mentioned several times in your videos that you're an English major. What are some of your favorite poems, poets, that you read during your studies? Do you have an all-time favorite poem? Yeah, sure, I love poetry. Uh, it's hard to get out of uh, being an English major without at least developing a grudging in my admiration for poetry. And my admiration is, is not uh, grudging. There are, there's a lot of poetry, most of which I did discover during my studies, uh, that I really, really love um, from all eras of, of English literature. Um, there is a lot of 19th century poetry that I really like, the, the, the poets you mentioned. Um, there's some modern poetry as well. Uh, my, one of my creative writing classes, I think, uh, no, it wasn't a creative writing class, it was a survey of modern American poetry, and that's where I discovered uh, John Ashbery, and we read uh, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, which um, I have mixed feelings about. Like, there, there are parts of it that are just almost too beautiful, like his language is just exquisite, and then there are other parts where it's like, boy, this is kind of going on, you know, this this goes on for a while, um, but but there's there's genius in it, you know what I mean? Um, as far as my favorite poets and my favorite poems, um, the answer I usually give when anyone asks what, who my favorite poet is, is Emily Dickinson, and it's a very common answer, she's an incredibly popular poet, but you know, most of my taste. If you, if you ask me to list my favorites of most things, you see some really popular stuff. Um, my taste is very middle of the road and very boring. Uh, but I love Emily Dickinson, and there are two poems of hers in particular. She wrote these beautiful little jewels of, of poetry, and there are two of them in particular that, that I love and that I always remember. The first, And I'll read them to you because uh, I can't, I don't have, especially the first one, it's a little, uh, I don't have it memorized, but uh, it's from its poem number uh, 126, as, as reckoned by the Complete Poems, published in 1924. And it goes, The brain is wider than the sky. 
for put them side by side, the one the other will include with ease and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, for lift them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. It's really, I just think that's such a beautiful poem. And then the second one is much shorter. Uh, it's number 185, Emily Dickinson, and it says, Faith is a fine invention for gentlemen who see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. So those are my two favorite poems, probably, if I had to pick. I also love William Blake. I love Little Boy Lost. Um, but if I had to pick, I would probably say Emily Dickinson. Joseph Opiano. Hey, Steve, I have a question about your decision to change five stupid things to the low five in an effort to lessen your usage of the word stupid. I'd argue that stupid is an ableist because unlike autism or mental retardation, for example, stupidity is something that happens to everybody. How do you respond to this argument? Well, this is a very common argument that I've heard, uh, especially lately, since the uh, this week, the first episode of the retitled, sort of rebooted uh, version of Five Stupid Things that I'm just calling Five Things went up. And it was about ableism, because I figured, what the hell? Um, and this is an argument that I've, that I've heard quite a bit since I announced I was making this change. And it goes you know, pretty much as you stated it. Well, you know, s stupid has never been a clinical term for someone with a cognitive disability. Or people will also say, well, I'm not, when I say that something is stupid or someone is stupid, I'm not uh, referring to a person with uh, a cognitive disability. I'm not, I'm not talking about a disabled person. So, so why should that count as, as an ableist slur? And those things don't really matter. The thing that makes it ableist isn't that it is a clinical term, you know, uh, professionally or formally applied to cognitively disabled people. And it's not that you are using it to actually attack a disabled person. Most people who use the term stupid, and most people who use most ableist terms, honestly, uh, don't intend to inflict harm on disabled people. They do it unintentionally. They do it thoughtlessly. That's how I was doing it. That's how I still do it when I, when I do it. Um, I'm making an effort to not do it as much, but I still do it. Um, and I think what makes something ableist is, first, if the word has a history of being used as a term of abuse for cognitively disabled people, and stupid definitely uh, checks that box. Stupid uh, is a word that has been used and still is used to bully and to demean and insult and belittle people who have cognitive disabilities, people who have intellectual disabilities, people who are perceived as not being intelligent or not being mentally quick. So that's the first thing. It has that history, it has that baggage, and when a disabled person hears that word, many, many people who uh, have cognitive disabilities hear that word and associate it with their pain, with their bullying, with their marginalization. Uh, so that's, that's a big deal. And the second thing that makes something ableist, other than the way the word resonates with uh, disabled people, is that it represents using disability as a metaphor for something bad. Um, you're saying such and such a thing is stupid, and by calling it stupid, you are comparing it to a lack of mental quickness, to a lack of knowledge. Uh, or to a, a lack of, of intellectual ability or intellectual skill. You're, you're taking something that you don't like or something that you deem bad, and you are describing it metaphorically by referring to a disability. And that is the, the underlying factor of many, many forms of ableist language. In other words, disability is the, the ultimate example of something bad. And, uh, and that's a problem for many people. And that's why many terms are considered to be forms of, of ableist language. And I think that is the case with the word stupid. Uh, not everybody agrees with me. Not all disabled people agree with me. Uh, but enough people have made the case to me, both personal friends of mine and also people whose writing I have sought out to better understand this issue, uh, that I have decided that they have made their case. I agree.
Corey Donaldson, have you seen the teaser trailer for Star Wars Rogue One, and what are your thoughts on it? Yes, I have, and I thought it was really, really good. It was very intriguing. I love that uh, the hook for the movie is that line from the Forrest Whitaker character, where he's talking about uh, the hero, and he says, uh, what will you become? Like, the hook is character-based. They're not selling it as, you know, the untold story of the secret mission to steal the plans for the Death Star. That is clearly what the movie's going to be about. The trailer establishes that, so that's definitely there, and I'm sure that will be a hook for some people. Um, sort of uh, a, an untold story from the, the, the annals of, of Star Wars. But the real emotional hook in that trailer was based on her character. What will you do? How far will you have to go? What will you have to become in order to accomplish this mission? And I really like that. Um, that really appealed to me. And I am also sort of relishing the, <laughs> the uh, impotent outrage of man babies, uh, manosphere types on the internet, once again, who are flipping out because, oh my God, there's another Star Wars movie with uh, a woman in the lead. You know, and the, the outrage, from what I've seen anyway, the outrage for this one has not been nearly as bad as it was for uh, Rey in uh, Force Awakens, but it's still there. And as long as it's there, honestly, I, I hope that Disney makes Star Wars movies for the next 20 years, and I hope there is a female lead in every goddamn one of them. That would make me so happy. If we could have the one-two punch of kick-ass Star Wars movies uh, with uh, women in the lead and also continue to demonstrate the irrelevance <laughs> of uh, misogynists and whiners about having women in the lead of, of sci-fi movies and action movies, that would just be perfect. So let's do that. Can we do that? David Edwards, instead of forming new political parties, do you think enough laws can be put in this place to reform the current system? Things such as changing election financing, voter ID laws, etc. If new parties were formed, wouldn't they have to compete in an already corrupt system, often rendering them mute? Well, that's a really good point. And, you know, uh, you list laws that could be passed to reform the current system. And let's be honest, um, one of the laws or one of the changes that would have to be made in the current system, if we did want to have um, not a two-party system, but a three or a four or a five-party system, is there would have to be equal ballot access to other parties. Because in many, many states it is actually way more difficult to get on the ballot uh, if you are not either a Republican or a Democrat. If you are a member of a minor party, which is pretty much any party other than the big two, then it's often more difficult for you to get on the ballot. You might need more signatures to get your name on the ballot than you would if you were a Democrat or Republican. And plus, you also don't have nearly as broad or as reliable a base of support. You know, the Democratic and Republican Party are, are parties are, are very well established and have lots of money and have lots of influence and lots of people working for them. And it's just a lot easier if you're one of those to get on the ballot than if you are, you know, say, in the Green Party or the Reform Party or the Constitution Party or the Socialist Party or whatever. Um, so that would have to change as well. Uh, and yeah, there are, there are reforms we could make to the current two-party system that would at least drastically improve it. The the reforms you suggest, Dave, in your question, like getting rid of voter ID laws, you know, reforming uh, campaign financing, those things would be awesome. I would I would I would settle for those at least in the short term. Um, I would also love to see term limits. That would be great if we could have term limits and incredibly draconian term limits. So yeah, I mean, uh, having a multi-party system. Uh, beyond the two-party system is not the only solution to the problem. I think you could definitely create meaningful, significant solutions within the two-party system, um, and I would love to see that too. I would, I would love to see campaign finance reform and reforming voter ID laws and uh, all these other things that uh, could make it a, a, a an easier system to get into and an easier system. Uh, for voters to see themselves and see their interests uh, and their, their concerns and their issues represented. I think that would be great. But then again, it's probably not going to happen because we live in a world where change is difficult and incremental and often uh, 
delayed or even denied. For instance, I've tried I don't know how many times to come up with a clever way to throw to the next segment and I just can't do it. I can't make that change. That's why I'm still sitting here just just dribbling out meaningless words. This fatuous dialogue that, that, that does no good to anybody. And all I'm really doing is killing time until I inevitably am forced to say, as I always do, that it's time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. Troubleshooter 125 Lightning Round question. Steve, brokered RNC or clear nominee? Are you asking what I think will happen or what I would like to see happen? I think it's going to be a clear nominee. As as much as we hear about the drama and about the back behind the scenes politicking and there's going to be a broker convention and they're not going to let Trump have it, I think ultimately it's going to be a clear nominee. I just don't think life is that interesting. But if you're asking what would I like to see, obviously brokered RNC. A whole year ago, I noticed at least two gross spelling mistakes in my last question, and I felt ever so slightly ashamed. Did I hurt your English major feelings? Do you accept my apology? No, you did not hurt my English major feelings. Uh, and no, I don't accept your apology because it wasn't necessary. <laughs> uh. Jonathan Green, what's your opinion on that video of the black student almost assaulting the white student because the white student had dreadlocks? The black student used cultural appropriation as a reason to accost him. I have a hard time justifying uh, violence, but at the same time, it is not my place as a white person who has never experienced cultural appropriation to tell that black student how, uh, <laughs> how they should be responding or reacting when they feel affronted, when they feel insulted, when they feel attacked in some way, as obviously cultural appropriation is often seen as an attack, uh, or at, at the very least as a dismissal of the concerns uh, of another culture. So I, I mean, I'm not going to say that it was great that, it, uh, that the black student attacked the white student like that, or, um, you know, got, got in the white student's face like that, but at the same time, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, fuss about it because it's not my place you know it's not my job as a white person to tell black people how they need to respond to their own oppression patrick dodds steve it's if it's not presumptuous and if it's okay can i lob out a white room style challenge if so the dark knight or superman returns what's the better film and why it's not even uh that much of a challenge honestly i would say superman returns because it touches my heart and that's an incredibly subjective opinion, but then so is all film criticism, and in fact, so is all art criticism in general. Uh, if you ask me what's the better film, I say Superman Returns, because it gets me right here. It evokes an emotional response. So does The Dark Knight, by the way, but not nearly as much as Superman Returns. Superman Returns leaves me in a puddle, okay? I just, I can't tell you how much I love that movie. James Thompson, a puddle of what, by the way? I'm not going to tell you. James Thompson, what do you think of a Left Behind movie about religious fundamentalists being left behind in a world where everyone, even non-fundamentalist religions, have moved on and become more secular and progressive? I think that's a great idea, and if you can wait another 50 years or so to make it, it can be a documentary. Rotting in the Midwest, Steve, I feel it's safe to assume you are cool with petting bald heads as long as consent is involved, but how do you feel about licking bald heads? Well, again, that would be okay as long as consent was involved, including my consent. And depending on the head and who it's attached to and the circumstances surrounding it, I may choose to withhold that consent. I may not feel like licking some bald head. So, you know, it just depends. Matthew Patton, Jack McPherson versus Engineer Montgomery Scott. Well, it depends on what the contest is. If we're talking an arson contest, then Jack's going to win that. If we're talking uh, a drinking contest, I don't know. That might be close. That might actually be a tie. They, might, they may drink themselves to death. <laughs> but if it is a, an engineering contest or, you know, who can, who can fix the Enterprise before its orbit decays and it burns up in the planet's atmosphere or whatever, yeah, you got to go with Scotty on that one. So it just depends. They each have their own skills and they're, they're each good at different things, you know? 
Dear Wunder Bar Bar, have you ever looked at a micro car and wondered if a thousand car, if a thousand clowns were going to step out at any minute? Yes, this is the thought that I have every time I see a micro car, and it's the main reason why they terrify me. And I, I can't, I can't look at one. If I see a micro car, I am instantly just thrown into, uh, um, uh, uh, I have, I have like a fit. I mean, I'm terrified. I'm inconsolable. I won't be calmed. So please don't show me a microcar, because that's that's what will happen. So Ted Appel, hey Steve, if the election were held today and the choices were Donald Trump, Democrat, Ted Cruz, Republican, or Jill Stein Green, for whom would you vote? Jill Stein. Because I would be morally incapable of voting for either Donald Trump or Ted Cruz, no matter what party they were on the ticket for. Of if those were my three choices, I would vote for Jill Stein easily. I would run to my local elementary school, which is my polling place, to vote for Jill Stein. I would sprint there. So there you go. That's the last question. That's it for the lightning round. Before I go, time for a shout out. And the shout out this week goes to a guy whose channel is just awesome and is so goddamn funny. I love when I can give shout outs to really funny channels. And the shout out this week goes to H Bomber Guy, who makes the funniest videos. He makes videos that kind of uh, take the piss out of manosphere types, men's rights types. Uh, anti-feminist types. He makes these really funny videos featuring v different versions of himself. Sometimes he's him, sometimes he's playing characters, sometimes he's doing like a, a response to another video, but his writing is just so funny. And his acting is funny too. He's just a really funny guy and I've so loved uh, watching his channel over the last couple of weeks because I just recently discovered it and I am becoming a really big fan of his. So if you enjoy seeing someone with a great sense of humor and a really sharp uh, knack for comic writing and comic performance and, and comic character performance particularly uh, who also likes to take the piss out of misogynists and sexists uh, check out H Bomber Guy's YouTube channel it is highly recommended H Bomber Guy absolutely love it also I absolutely love the Late Seating Podcast and all of the Let Me Listen podcasts, which I now get to mention for the second time, thanks to an earlier question. You can check out all of the Let Me Listen podcasts, which are the product of my very good friend Jason Harding, Jason with a D here on YouTube, uh, the puppet master of opinion. But you can check them all out online at lemmelistenpodcasts.com, and you can listen to all the episodes of Let Me Finish, which he co-hosts with Atticus Blake, a.k.a. Finite Atticus, all of the episodes of American Monsters and How to Destroy Them, which is hilarious, a great improv comedy podcast. And you can listen to all the episodes of Late Seating, the movie review podcast that Jason co-hosts with me. It is awesome. It's one of my favorite things that I do. Um, I love that so many of you guys are listening to it. It seems like it's really starting to gain a little bit of popularity and take off, and I cannot thank you all enough. And those of you who have never listened to the Late Seating Podcast, give it a, give it a listen. Go to let me... Go to Let Me Listen Podcast. I'm going to get it out one of these days. It's on the screen there. Go to LetMeListenPodcast.com and check out the most recent episode of uh, Late Seating, which is our review of the animated classic The Jungle Book. It goes up today, the same day that this video is being published. So check it out. Check out all of the Let Me Listen Podcasts at LetMeListenPodcast.com. You won't be sorry, I promise. And if you are sorry, don't tell me about it because I don't really care. But I think you're going to really like it. Check it out. Oh, boy, that's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. I want to remind you, as always, to please leave a comment on this video to ask me your question for next time. I assure you, you can ask me anything about anything. Nothing is too serious. Nothing is too silly. I will answer as many of your questions as I possibly can in the next video. So until then, take care, everybody. One last thing, as always, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like it and share it and subscribe to this channel if you're not subbed already. And also, please consider helping me to make more videos like this one by supporting this channel through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash steveshives to become a patron. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you next time.